What's going on everybody? It's Max the Catfish and I lied to you in the last episode of our tutorial series. I said that was going to be the last part, but after I made it, I realized there's a little bit more that I wanted to show. So if you haven't checked out the rest of the tutorial series, I'll put a link up in this corner here for you to check out number one. Otherwise, let's just jump right into it with all the other stuff around warfare, planetary invasions, the importance of armies, and well, how do you make the most of that post-war period? Let's jump right in. So when we left off, we had gained a little bit of space from our northern enemy, the Spear Kata. And you'll remember that we didn't grab all of the of the systems that they owned because while we had claims on them, we didn't actually control them at the end of our uh, at the end of our war, at the end of our campaign, which is fine. We can always pick those up in a future war and we don't have to claim them either. The ones that we had claims on already, we will continue to have claims on until we unclaim them. Now claims are interesting because when you have claims on, an, uh, on a nation, they actually are upset about that. It makes them a little bit more upset every month because you have basically declared to the world that that is your system, that you own it, that you deserve to own it. So uh, keep that in mind. You don't want to just claim space from an ally of yours. If you've got an ally, perhaps on the other side of you, we haven't met any allies in this uh, in this gameplay so far. But a couple of things happened toward the end of the war that we didn't really uh, capitalize on. And I want to capitalize on those now. The first is you'll notice in the upper left hand corner, we've got this technology that we need to grab. And I had a question in the warfare tutorial where somebody asked, why didn't you take afterburners on your Corvettes? And the answer was that if we take a look at our ship designer and we go to the Corvette that we built, this one here, we actually couldn't put an afterburner on here. Uh, afterburners require 10 power usage or 10 additional power, and we don't have that available to us in the power section under the ship stats. The way that we would get that is by upgrading our reactor in all of our ships. But in order to do that, of course, you need to have the technology and look at that. The fusion reactor tech is here and uh, waiting to be researched. If we research this, we'll get access to a fusion reactor module that will give us a little bit more power for all of our ships, not just Corvettes, but the entire line of ships into the future. Usually a good one to grab. Basic combat rolls also gives you a nice little bonus to your ships, but fusion reactor is going to allow us to put those afterburners on the Corvettes. I want to do that, so I'm going to research fusion reactor. The second thing in the upper left is that we have a timed project. Now, this is one of those icons that I try not to uh, not to dismiss because actually it's really important for you to know what's up there. A timed project is a project that you can research either with a science vessel or sometimes with a construction vessel or a military vessel. And it gives you something kind of like technology, but if you don't do it in time, it's gone forever. And so there is some debris in the system of Yakuri here where we had our combat versus our opponent. And this debris is something that we can go and research. This is debris left over from our uh, from our battle. Uh, battle. That's not a word. From our battle. This is debris from an enemy ship. And what we can do is we can take one of our science vessels and go over there and research that project. And that will actually give us a little bit of research toward that project, toward whatever technology they had on their ship already, which is pretty neat. So if they've been researching lasers, but we've been researching uh, missiles, right? When we research that project, we'll get a little bit of tech toward the laser technology that they had on their ships, which is pretty cool. So I'm gonna send that vessel to go do that. And in the meantime, I'm gonna grab another science vessel. We actually, I think we had this guy over here uh, doing the last of the research on that side. I'm gonna have them head this way and explore. And I'm doing this because remember, when you end a combat, when you end a war with somebody, you have 10 years of peace. And in those 10 years, you have completely open borders with them. I wanna find out how many systems do they own? How many planets do they own? And what is it gonna take us for us to completely conquer them, to completely wipe them out and take over their entire space? So I'm gonna take our science vessel to go do that. They're going to pop over really quickly and uh, and research some of these, explore some of these systems. 
in the meantime, let's take a look at some of our planets. Oh, here's the here's that uh, debris from Yakri, right? We can see that we got 10% progress toward fusion power, which is perfectly timed because that's what we're researching right now. We'll have to spend 10% less time doing that. And then we got a little bit of extra physics research and engineering research from that as well. Nice to have, you know, no, nothing groundbreaking, but there's always debris at the end of a combat. So it's always good to have your science vessels on hand to go and research those projects. Whether you win or lose the war, you'll always have something to gain out of it, no matter what. So let's uh, dismiss that and I'll take our other science vessel. I'll have them explore out this way. Now I'm doing that because you can see the border of the Spear Kata is sort of fading out into space here. And that means they own some systems that we have never explored or have never found yet. So uh, going out in this direction, we're going to be able to see the full extent of what their, what their borders look like. Now I was taking a look at uh, Alpha Centauri and that's because I've got an icon here on the right side, that little up arrow, which means we can upgrade our capital building. And what that means is when you first settle on a planet, you are literally using the carcass of your uh, your colony ship as your structure, as your main colony's structure, your capital building. But in order to actually turn this into a city in a thriving world, we have to upgrade that. So I'm going to definitely upgrade that one because it's going to give this uh, this planet a nice bonus. And let's fix some of the unemployment on our other planets here. I am noticing one of our planets has a building slot available in it. And my recommendation for your first building on basically every planet, unless there's something really specific you want to get, is remember that gene clinics research that we researched in the tech tree? I'm going to build gene clinics on each of our planets. Gene clinics increase the pop growth speed of our civilization on our planets. And so if you have a gene clinics on that planet, your population will grow faster, which means your planet will actually grow faster and you'll be able to get more resources, more of that good stuff for your empire. So I'm gonna let that go. I'm guessing the same thing is on Asterion. Yeah, let's go ahead and build that. And let's talk a little bit here about this decision because this one is a toughie. We've got two technologies here that I would highly recommend you research as soon as possible. The first is Destroyer Tech, which is the next class of ship above our Corvettes. And in it, getting destroyers, we'll be able to actually shoot down enemy Corvettes. This is a massive technology to get. And the earlier you can get it, the better it is for you for those early game fights. The other one is the Starhold technology. And Starhold technology allows us to upgrade our star bases from these puny little two module star bases into a four module star base. And we'll get a new building slot that we can build into our star bases as well. Starhold is a fantastic technology. If Destroyer wasn't here, I would grab it. But this is the way to go for sure, especially because we're going to wage a new war soon. So I'm going to grab that one. Now, I can see that the Spear Kata are kind of extending their borders, extending them down this way. We can see almost the extent of their eastern side of things. And you know what? Inside of their borders is some other species, which is very very interesting i wonder if that's if that's possibly a um an npc species like a kind of a, a minor faction or something i'm not quite sure so let's go ahead and research them and our other science vessel is trying to figure out what the heck's going on here i am going to guess they've either not taken this system because it's very low value or there's something there let's get rid of all these Whew, tons of pop-ups uh, and just some really quick technology decisions here. Let's grab that one. I'm kind of curious. Hmm. Oh, maybe they just, they just don't want it, I guess, possibly. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that is. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and explore all of the unexplored systems in their space really quick. Looks like they have four systems so far with planets, which means we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Now, I do want to make some claims towards those planets, so I'm going to start claiming some of these. 
you'll notice that the cost of claiming is getting more and more expensive the further we get from our borders. So this one, I don't remember what it was when we when we claimed it was pretty cheap. Uh, it's 40. This one costs 60 influence. This one costs 80 influence and so on and so forth as we get close to their uh, to their systems with planets. I'm going to go ahead and claim their capital system because I want that at the end of whatever combat that we have with them. It's very, very valuable to us because it probably has the most population on it. And then I'm going to claim as many of these, which is really only one, of their planets with, uh, uh, rather their systems with planets on them. And we're going to let our influence build up over the next couple of years while we, while we let that happen. Um, and at the same time, it would be a really good idea for us to build a couple of destroyers once our destroyer technology finishes. So we're going to have to remember to do that as well. All right. So that is happening. Now we've got our two fleets of Corvettes here, and we've got a little bit of technology that's built up over the past couple of, of years while we've been uh, uh, kind of in between these wars. So I'm going to make sure that I upgrade these fleets by clicking upgrade fleet here. And you know what? Even one better than that, it's probably a good idea for us to retrofit our oldest or our closest station that we had built in Fainov into a, into a shipyard so that we can build new ships. And that way, our ships don't have to go all the way back to Asterion to go and get repaired. I'm just going to uh, kind of send them to Feynob for now and have them upgrade there. And then the other thing I want to do is make sure that our forward starbase is actually loaded out with gun batteries and uh, the disruption field generator, I think would be a good idea. Yeah, perfect. I'm going to build a crew quarters in Feynov as well, which is going to reduce the cost of our ships that are docked there. Not really a, a, a big thing in the early game, but that becomes much, much, much more valuable in the late game. I'm also noticing I am way over on our naval capacity. So if I can find a naval capacity upgrade in order to boost this to 40, say, ships, I would like to do that as well. So we're going to we're going to keep an eye on that and hopefully we get a technology that comes up that allows us to do that. Okay. Feynov's shipyards are building. In the meantime, Feynov the planet needs some work. This, to me, a size 13 planet could go one of two ways. We could either turn this planet into an industrial planet, which produces alloys and consumer goods for us, which we actually need. We're in a consumer good deficit. Or because there are so many generator districts here, there's, there's seven generator districts, we could turn this potentially into a generator district planet, though it's not great. Uh, when I'm deciding which planets to specialize where, I'm actually looking at the other planets that I have to see exactly what they're specialized in. I can see that we already have Alpha Centauri as a perfect generator district planet. So I'm going to build our generators here on Alpha Centauri. And that means if we go back to Feynov, I'm going to turn this into an industrial district instead. Hovering over this, how you make some of these decisions too, you should be very careful. You'll notice that the approximate job upkeep of the industrial district is 12 minerals. And I have right now an income of 30 minerals. So I'm using about one third of our minerals over one third of our minerals uh, in this new industrial district. If we build this, this is the balancing act that you have to decide when you're deciding which districts you want to build on which planet. I'm going to go ahead and build an industrial district there. I also noticed that Asterion has a not only unemployment, but also a housing issue. I think we might turn Asterion into, let's just do a food, oh, just kidding. It's the abandoned terraforming project. This too, unfortunately, is one of those planets where it doesn't really do anything particularly well. I think I might just build a city district and turn this into a, pl a planet that gives us unity, perhaps. Uh, instead, or or uh, maybe maybe bureaucracy, possibly. We'll see when we get there. But I do want to fix the unemployment and the housing issues. So let's go ahead and build a city district there. Okay. We have gotten a little bit better of a look at the Spirkata. And our science vessel out here is actually kind of 
I just want to send it to explore because I want to see if there are any other species out there that exist out in the galaxy. There must be, right? There must be. We can't possibly be alone. It's not just us in the Spear Top. So I'm going to send our science vessel out. To... In fact, there it is. The Commonwealth of Man. I think just, just established communications with us. And they are... <laughs> I, I was hoping it Oh my gosh, that's brutal. They are xenophobic and fanatic materialists. They hate other empires. They don't want to want to be related to them. And not only that, they are willing to go to war to crush them and destroy them. That is kind of scary. That's kind of not good. You could do a couple things here. We've got a bunch of envoys that we could apply to this. One way that you could look at this is go, hey, look, um, there's no chance that we're going to be friends, so we might as well just build a spy network or harm relations and uh, declare them as a rifle and just know that we're going to go to war with them in the future. If you're already dealing with an aggressive neighbor like we are, the better plan might be to improve relations in the meantime. And, and if you can improve relations and sort of counteract the, their, their tendency as xenophobic empire to, to decrease relations with you, if you can manage to do that, you can kind of hold them off from going to war with you for a period of time. That's the strategy that I'm going to employ because I don't want to have to go to war with two empires simultaneously. That would be, that would be big bad for us. That would, that would not be good. Okay. So, our ships have upgraded. I'm gonna upgrade this fleet as well. I've got this deficit of food and consumer goods, and there's a couple of ways that we could actually fix those. The first way that I would recommend you do, I don't have the technology for it. There is a technology called hydroponics bays, and it allows you to build a hydroponics lab on a space station, on a um, star base. And if you do that, it will generate 10 food for the cost of one energy. It's really, really efficient. And I highly recommend you basically load those over all of your star bases all over your empire. I can't do that right now uh, because I don't have the, the tech for it. So we're gonna keep an eye out for the tech. But um, this is one of those moments where you have to ask yourself, what's more important? Is it more important for you to take the space that you have around your empire? Or is it more important for you to prepare for a big, big war and a big amount of claims against your opponents. I would argue the latter. So I'm going to try to claim, although they just grabbed a cheeky little uh, system with a planet back here. I'm gonna try to claim as many of the systems with planets as I possibly can from the Spear Kata. It is going to be a gigantic battle for the rest of their space. So let's let that happen a little bit. Here's our conversation with the Commonwealth of Man. To smooth things over with them, I'm going to give them the positive reaction. Our citizens all send their regards, all of them. And and we're just gonna let that let that happen. Um, meanwhile, our science vessel still has been granted, thankfully, with the Commonwealth, open borders with them. And we can start to see now, now we're not being insulted by our opponents, we start to see some positive things coming in from the AI faction, the Commonwealth of Man. The first is they want to initiate a, uh, a non-aggression pact. And this prevents you from being able to attack each other as long as this is in place. It is a really, really, really valuable thing to get from another empire because it means that there is no way that they can attack you without giving you advanced notice. You will hear They've broken their non-aggression pact, and then you'll have a period of time to prepare, and then they'll have a chance to attack you in a war. So I will definitely take this from the Commonwealth of Man. And the other one is they want to establish an embassy. And all this does is it provides a, a, a way for your two empires to gain trust in one another. Usually a good thing to do diplomatically with empires that you want to grow with and, and have diplomatic relations. And usually a really bad thing to make with empires that you do not want to relate to. Because an embassy, when it, when it gives you that trust with one another, it also gives your spy masters an ability to spy a little bit deeper into your opponent's ongoings or into your ongoings. So keep that in mind. 
I will take one from the Commonwealth of Man, though, because I think that they're actually going to end up being our friends. And on that note, I'll finish off the last, uh, uh, last tradition in the Diplomacy Tree, which unlocks our second Ascension perk. Now, Ascension perk number two, I think you've got the same list as Ascension perk number one. I think maybe Interstellar Dominion is a new one. There are a lot of Ascension perks and different ways you can go about this. This one is sort of the, the Ascension perk for people who aren't very patient because uh, you can always gain star bases. You can always make claims eventually as long as you build up your influence. This just makes that cheaper to do. And if you're really, really, really impatient, you can grab Interstellar Dominion. If you really think that claims are going to be like a core of your gameplay, you can grab Interstellar Dominion. I think you can get everything that you want in this game without taking it. Conversely, something like One Vision has actually become much stronger. And I think in the community has, be, has almost risen above technological, what, what is it called? Technological ascendancy as a starting perk to grab. I think One Vision is fantastic. Unity has so many new uses now that it's a really valuable resource. I'm probably going to end up taking that one. Uh, the other ones here, Executive Vigor gives you more Edicts Fund, which is pretty good. That's a, that's a nice economic uh, uh, ascendancy, Ascension perk to take. Transcendent Learning isn't particularly great, but it gives your, you access to more powerful leaders and stronger leaders. I say eh. Shared Destiny is actually pretty good, especially if you're going to have a lot of vassals in the game, which I'm not going to get into in this tutorial series. That is an advanced concept. Uh, but but it's actually not half bad, especially if you want to play the diplomatic game. It gives you access to two new envoys, which is pretty sweet. I'm going to take one vision. Let's grab one vision. And uh, let's let's just see what we can do with a, an actual positive person, a, a, a cordial empire that we uh, that we can actually speak to. We've got a bunch of check marks on options here that we can negotiate with them, including defensive pacts. Now. Each one of these options gives you either a militaristic or an economic benefit for your empires, and usually you share in that benefit, but it's usually not an equal share. What I mean by that is if we take a look at commercial pact, um, I think it's on the check mark. No, they don't show us this. We actually don't know enough about our ally to know what their technology level is or what their ec economic level is. We will gain this over time if we continue to build up a positive relationship with them. But for now, if we chose to form a commercial pact with them, we would not only increase the trust with them each month because we're benefiting each other, but also we will gain a, an amount of energy that is proportionate to how much energy and how much trade value they have in their empire. We don't know what that is, so we can't exactly say, but this will cost you an amount of influence each month. And so you don't just want to throw these trade deals and these commercial pacts and, and these defensive pacts to every empire in the galaxy. If you do, you won't earn enough influence to do stuff like propose things in the Galactic Council or take new space or make claims. So keep in mind that all of your diplomatic options all pretty much use the same currency of influence. I'm not going to engage in a commercial pact. I won't do a research agreement either because I don't know what their research level is. It's probably stronger than ours, but who knows? Guarantee independence. This is more of a, this is more of a like, hey, look, you're a little baby empire. I want you to, to be able to be your own empire and be your own person. So we are going to make sure that if you ever get attacked, we come in and defend you, but you don't have to defend us. Whereas a defensive pact says, if you get attacked, we will automatically join the war. And if we get attacked, you will automatically join the war. So this is a big one. You don't want to form a, a defensive pact with a small empire unless they have something that they can actually give you or benefit, you know, benefit you. Opening these kind of negotiations with empires have big effects on both of your empires and how likely it is that you get pulled into wars that you didn't start or additional wars that you never could have expected. So keep that in mind. For now, we'll end that. 
and uh, our eyes are on the Spirkata. They have a massive empire. They, they have taken a lot of space, and they've taken a lot of planets as well, which is kind of scary. That's kind of scary. Um, let's take a look at some of our... Uh, oh, you know what? Actually, I wanted to cover one thing. Two things, really, because now is the time to do it. The first is some of you have been asking, what is that white border inside of your large, thick border? That is called a sector. And sectors are actually really powerful and the game doesn't explain to you how to use them. So let's explain it now. That sector is, uh, is a region of space that centers on a sector capital, which is a planet that you own. And the sector extends, I think it's four, four systems out. One, two, three, four. Yep, from the sector capital for us, because it was our default capital planet, that is the planet of Earth. Now, a sector allows you to bind the planets and all the systems far away from the center of it, which is Earth or Sol, and it allows you to elect a governor. And governors will give you benefits across all of the planets inside of that sector. I think also probably all the systems inside that sector. We've got a governor here waiting to be applied to this. This is Dolores. And Dolores gives every single one of our planets the benefit that bureaucrats will produce 10% more unity. I mean, that's just free resource, right? At this point, we're paying for Dolores. We're paying two unity per month to keep her here. Might as well employ her as our sector governor. You can always click on the governor icon from any of these planets here and get to this screen where you can recruit different governors. Maybe you have a sector that is undergoing massive growth or you just gained it and you really are focused on the cost of buildings and districts. That actually would be kind of beneficial to us, honestly, but I don't want to spend 300 unity to grab it. I'm going to keep Dolores on there for now. That's totally fine. Now you'll notice that there's an area of our space that doesn't have a sector around it, and that's because sectors have to be created manually by you, the player. And so what we could do, and it's not bad to do this, I think it might be worth it, is we could go to our planet of Fainov Prime and we can build a new sector by clicking Create New Sector. I'll say, I don't think this is the perfect situation because you'll notice that the number of jumps from Fainov to the border of our other sector is only one jump. Kind of sucks that that's the case. It means that our sector can't be as large as it possibly could. The ideal situation is that we would have a planet one, two, three, four systems away, or maybe even better, one, two, three, four systems away and build a sector from that. But my, my guidance here is try to build as many sectors as you possibly can that are as large as you can possibly make them. You don't want your governors to take up a bunch of unity upkeep. So I'm going to go ahead and build a new sector by clicking this button here, create new sector. And that wraps all of these systems in up to four systems away from Fainov in our new sector. Uh, very interestingly shaped. And we can go here and assign a new governor. And this I actually will recruit Esteban as our governor here, who's going to reduce the cost of building new uh, new districts and new buildings on this planet by 10%, which is pretty sweet. If we were to go over here to Dongar and grab one of these planets here, he would also extend the sector to that point and provide its benefit to those planets additionally, which is pretty, pretty hack and sweet. This planet here, Fainov Prime, we said we were gonna throw gene clinics on and build some industrial districts. I'm gonna build an industrial district and a city district just so that we don't have pops that are unhoused. Remember, we talked a little bit about how a population that doesn't have a home or is homeless will start to generate crime or start to reduce stability, and we really don't want that. So just so I don't have to go back here every single moment, I'm gonna build a couple of city districts. Here on this planet, we talked about making this our home for, here it is, for unity. Um, actually, I think we do that in the administrative offices. So I'm going to build an administrative office there. All right. Now, let's talk about, because we're in Warfare Part 2, let's talk about the FTL inhi inhibition or FTL inhibitors. This is your strongest defensive technology in all of the tech trees. 
This is an incredibly, incredibly powerful technology that I'm going to grab right now. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how this works. It's going to be hard for me to show you, though. FTL inhibitors is strong because it prevents your opponents from flying through systems that they haven't taken in a war. So the wording of it says your opponent's ships may only leave your systems through the hyper lane that they entered. So for instance, if we had an opponent come through Calf into, oh boy, I chose a, I chose a tough one here, Aftrashan, Aftrashan, right? And they were unable to take the star base here because they didn't have the fleet power to do it. They couldn't then fly to the next system and try to go for Ethuk. They could not do that because FTL inhibitors prevents them from doing it. This is a module that gets automatically placed on every single one of the star bases you control in every single one of your systems. And so it requires your opponents to take those star bases before they can continue to the next one and to the next one and to the next one. Now, when they get to a system that owns a planet that has a planet in it, if that planet has a fortress built on it, which is an upgrade, I show you, it is an upgrade to the stronghold. If they have, if that planet has a fortress on it, those ships can't continue to the next system until they take not only the star base down, but also that they take the planet over completely. So FTL inhibitors massively will help protect your space in, in combat, and it will force your opponents to really dedicate resources and time to take the systems that they have claims on. Highly recommend the technology. It is very valuable. Please, please, please make sure you pick up FTL inhibitors and understand how that works. Oh, you know what? Ah, this is fleet capacity. Ah, I'll take this one. Uh, so that you understand your defensive and, and bolster your defensive options in, in combat. Now, I want to take a look at the Spear Kata because I was worried about this. In the last couple of years, they have built up their fleet power to be equivalent again to ours. At the end of the war, they were inferior. So we're going to do something and, and build up our fleet in preparation for this. But the thing that I want to know, the thing that is most important for me, is how long is our truce? And actually, I, I know the answer. It's, it's, it's over. All of the hyperlane colors between each of their systems have turned red. And I think while I was talking, one of our ships just went missing in, in action. And that's because when an opponent closes their borders to you, at that moment, all of the ships that you own inside of their space get kicked out. They don't get destroyed. They just get kicked back to their home uh, system, wh wherever their home system is within your space. So we we had our science vessel, I think, was in here researching stuff. We didn't get all of the research we wanted because I was focused on other things, but we got a decent amount of, of info about what the Spirit Kata's space is. And we have an extra little bit of, of influence that we can use to claim H uh, Hadricus here, Hadricus. And so it's about time for us to start our next war. Before we do that, of course, I want our fleet power to be greater than my opponents. And now that I know a little bit about them, I can do that. I'm gonna go into the fleet manager and taking a look at the two fleets that we have, these are actually the two fleets that are stationed in Feynov. I'm gonna go ahead and add a new ship to each of these fleets that is our destroyer before we do that i want to make sure that our destroyer actually looks good is actually like a design that we like so if we take a look at our destroyer notice we have a lot more guns up here than we did on our on our corvette and this is a pretty good loadout though you know depending on what your opponent's ships look like i might want to put a couple more blue lasers on there instead i'm going to throw on afterburners to speed this ship up and increase its evasion a little bit because we've got the power to do so. And right now we can kind of play with what the fission and fusion reactors look like too. Keep in mind, every technology that you gain in this game costs more money and more resources to build. So you'll notice that the fission reactor costs 20 alloys, but the fusion reactor costs 26. You get 40 more power for that, but we don't need it. We could build this with fission reactors if we wanted to. So. 
you know, this isn't the best way of doing it because auto upgrade is automatically going to bump that up to the next level. But if you wanted to get really specific with it, if you really wanted to just cut every corner you possibly could and keep your costs as low as you possibly can, you could uncheck auto upgrade and press save. This would make all of your destroyers six alloys cheaper. In the grand scheme of things, that's such a little amount. I don't really care that much. So I'm just going to save this. And let's start producing some destroyers. I'm actually, instead of going to our star bases and manually creating them by clicking this button, I'm going to go into the fleet manager. I'm going to look at our two fleets and I'm going to add a ship designed to each of them, which is our brand new destroyer class. And I'm going to say add five. Let's add five to each fleet. Just like that. And now I'm going to go ahead and reinforce each fleet by clicking the reinforce fleet button. And that is automatically going to generate the ships for each one of those fleets. Now, a couple things are going to happen here. The first is I, I, I'm just going to dismiss these requests from our uh, from the Commonwealth of Man up here. The first is our energy credits are going to tank. They're absolutely going to tank. We've got no option to fix that because I haven't researched the technology for it. This is a recurring trend today, but there is an uh, an edict that you can turn on called capacity subsidies if you research the, the appropriate technology and it will give you an increase of energy credits. The other thing that we could do is because we have some un unhoused people and some people are starting to get a little bit upset, we can start building generator districts on various planets around the galaxy. Not the cleanest way of doing this, but it is certainly a option or an, an option that you can take in order to in order to uh, prepare for the energy credit deficit that we're going to incur during this war. The other thing you might consider doing is because we have so many minerals, I might consider selling some of these minerals into energy credits and giving ourselves a bigger buffer for the war that's about to happen. Now, you'll notice that the fleet power of the Spirit Kata suddenly has switched to inferior, and that's because we're producing ships that are able to shoot down theirs much better. And that's fantastic. So this war is going to be kind of a piece of cake for us, which is exactly what we want. Let's go ahead and do it. I'm gonna bring our ships up to the front lines. You'll notice already that our energy credit deficit has has now completely dropped. It is completely swept, uh, switched from positive to negative. Part of that was that we left our crew quarters, which was providing us with a 25% upkeep reduction for our fleets. And the other part is that we just built a bunch of ships. So let's get our ships to the front line. Let's look at the Spirit Katab. Before we start this war, of course, let's go into claims and see if we can just claim a few more pieces of space. Try to get as many of this cluster as we possibly can. The ideal situation actually is just to claim Pell. If you can take all of your opponent's planets and they own no planets at all, they won't be able to continue as an empire. Their entire empire breaks down and then you can take all the systems yourself. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that we've got a war for planets. And what that means is we have to actually be able to take those planets. You do that not with ships, but with assault armies. So let's talk about assault armies really quick. I'm going to skip on upgrading our reassembled ships uh, shelter because we're going to need those minerals. If you go to the armies tab of any planet, you can see how many troops are in that planet's garrison. This is the planet's defensive ability to defend against attacks. And both us and our opponents have, uh, have troops that are in this garrison that are protecting our planets from invasion. This garrison is actually created by typically by worker or sorry, soldier jobs that are located in the ship shelter, um, the ship shelter location. Now, what's strange to me, I'm actually looking at this. I don't see. Ah, here we go. It's it's on the colonist job, planetary defense armies plus one. So we've got an army uh, because of these jobs that has been created by the colonist job that's creating armies. If we take a look at Earth, I think we'll see, oh, it's actually exactly the same, which is kind of surprising. Sometimes your, uh, your planetary administration will create soldier jobs and soldiers will create defense armies. Okay, so that's the defensive armies, but what about our assault armies where we go and use them to attack? 
you recruit them on planets using the recruit button in the armies tab. And if you click on recruit, you may have a list of options here of various recruitment. You'll be able to recruit armies of every species that you have as part of your empire. And if you're playing a robotic empire, you'll even be able to recruit armies like massive war bots that have much, much, much higher strength than the typical, say, squishy human, right? But for now, what we have access to is humans. You'll notice that humans, in order to recruit them as assault armies, they cost minerals and they cost a decent amount of minerals and they cost an upkeep cost of energy. This is why war is so expensive. So we're going to have to flash in, grab the systems, get the planets and end the war as fast as possible before our economy completely collapses. So let's build up some assault armies here. These get built one at a time. So I'm going to actually go to one of our other planets and use it to recruit some humans. And then let's go to Earth and use it to recruit some humans and go to Alpha Centauri and use it to recruit some humans. I'm doing this because the average, uh, the average assault troop doesn't do much damage. It only has a power of 23. And if you remember taking a look at this, the, uh, the troops that are actually on our planets right now have a power of 35. Stellaris, certainly gives benefit to the defender of most battles. In fact, if you're in a defensive war, oftentimes your defensive armies will have a boost as well. So keep that in mind. You're going to need to, if you're a bit of a warmonger, you are going to need to uh, kind of overpower your opponent, not just meet them in combat, uh, in combat power. We've got a new option for tradition and normally I would keep the, the ball rolling here with, with war, but we've got an option in this list that we might want to look at, which is the supremacy tradition. Always a good one to get if you're going to play a warfaring race. I highly, highly recommend it. So I'm just going to adopt this one. Inside of here are traditions like your ships will fire 10% faster or your ship upkeep is reduced by 10% or your ship build cost and speed are reduced and increased, right? So keep an eye on the supremacy tree. Almost everybody takes this one. If you're gonna play purely defensive, there's another one in a DLC that you can get called Unyielding. I talked about it in a previous tutorial. You can grab that instead. But for now, let's definitely replace this leader. Okay, and let's get our growing army up to the front lines. So I'm gonna take these armies we're going to put them up like this. And you know what? Because that was so fast, I'm going to recruit a couple more toward the front line so that they can support the people that are attacking. Let's let's start our war. Uh, Spear Katas, still inferior to us, though they have superior technology. Let's, let's get them while we still have the upper hand. I'm going to declare war, do a war for conquering, and declare war against them. And then in a second, boom, we're ready to go. I don't think there's much coming from these systems. I, I'm going to I'm going to play it a little bit unsafe here and assume that that they don't have star bases or ships on the right side of their space might be a, a bit of a dangerous assumption to make. Maybe it would be good for us to pop over here. It's just kind of a waste because really what we care about are the planets here. So instead, I'm just going to have our our ships swoop in. Take their star bases just like this can actually see the health of the star base go down as they're attacking it. That's what's happening. And we can see the first of their fleets. They've got 11K versus our 28K. Let's jump right in and take them while they're exposed. Hopefully. We might just make it. Ooh, we just missed it, actually. It was really close. I'm going to chase this fleet. And why I'm doing this is because it is much more valuable for us to take their fleet out. We got stuck destroying the starbase and they got away again. They're crafty. They're crafty. I think this might be where we get them. I hope we can win this war, actually. You know what? I'm going to check something really quick. Okay. Sometimes you've got uh, edicts in here that will strengthen your ships. Right now, I don't have them, so that's fine. I'm just gonna, we're gonna jump right in. And you know what? I think they kind of misplayed. I know the AI makes mistakes sometimes. The AI probably should have taken their fleet and stationed it at the Starbase, where they could benefit from the Starbase's 498 fleet power. 
Instead, they took their fleet and stationed it at the border of their of their space. And so their star base is too far to actually engage in that combat. That's a big mistake that players make. You know, sometimes catching your opponents out when you have the advantage by, by sitting at the edge of your system where people will jump in gives you the upper hand. But in the case where you're in a losing situation like they were, it actually ended up losing them the battle. So let's go ahead and jump in and grab their home star base. This should just take a second. And now that we've taken out their main fleet and we've taken out almost all of their armies, I'm going to start splitting our fleets into two fleets. And I'm doing that because I want to take as much space as I possibly can before... Ooh, I take that back. Their fleet just came back. 958 sitting here. Let's head towards them. Now they shouldn't be able to get away unless they're all Corvettes. There we go. And then our slower fleet comes in here to help finish them off. I think by now they probably don't have any fleet power left. I think that was probably the complete and total maximum of their fleet power. I'm going to go into claims and uh, take a look at Clue. It's the only one that was part of this cluster that we couldn't control. And I still don't have the influence to be able to grab that. 14 influence, though, by the end of the war should be no problem. Okay, so now let's split our fleets. Head that way. And we have cut a path for our armies to come in and start taking planets. We've got 182 army strength. I think we have uh, 130 sitting here waiting to come in. So I'll, I'll merge these two fleets together. And the other thing, <coughs> excuse me, is we should probably put a leader on it, a general, who is going to give us uh, and our army a, a strength in battle. These are unfortunately three that don't particularly make your army stronger. They just give you utility for your army over the course of the game. Um, none of these give you army strength or power or morale. So uh, between them, it doesn't really matter which one you take, but this one's the cheapest out of three kind of crappy options. So I'm just going to do that. And let's have our army just wait for the backups to join it, just so that we don't have two armies flying around um, uh, kind of independent of one another right now. Looks like our fleets are able to take out the remaining of their... Um, of their fleet, no problem. This is excellent. And we are going to keep moving through some of these systems. Now, I'm sitting here really hoping that the opponent does not surrender. If they surrender, I can't show you the mechanics of taking planets. But I think, I think they're going to try to fight back. Unless we really push them. So let's see. Our army has finally merged together. We've got a, an army of size 316. This should be plenty to take these uh, these opponents. And now let me just show you something visual from a really quick glance look of this combat. You'll notice that a lot of these systems have these little spikes coming out of the hexagon where the uh, where the flag is. And those spikes denote that we fully control that system. We control the star base and any planets in it. And you'll notice that some of them have our flag, but no spike like uh, Hadricus does. And that's because we only partly occupy this system. We need to occupy both the system, Starbase and the planet in order to actually occupy the system and get it at the end of the, of the war. So that's why our armies are here. Let's bring them in towards Hadricus. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm careful about where I'm sending them because if I sent them through tracks, which we do not own, our armies will be blown up. They don't have any defensive stats. They don't have any guns. So if they, if your armies ever come across an opponent's ships or a system that is not owned by you, they will get blown up. So protect your armies at all costs. Please be very careful. In fact, just to make sure this doesn't happen, I'm going to take our, uh, our military vessels, and we're going to take Trax and Kosk, as mistakes do happen. Okay. Now, a couple of other mechanics about warfare. When a military fleet or when a army is destroyed, 
it will be sent back to its home base. That is located in the fleet manager for each one of your fleets. The home base is denoted here uh, and, and can actually be changed. We probably should have changed this to Afshishan, Afshishan because it is the forward operating base that we own. If any of our fleets or our armies were destroyed, they'd be sent here rather than being sent all the way back to Seoul. That would suck, right? It would take them so much longer to get to the front. We've got pirates in our borders. We'll deal with that later. We've got pirates in our borders. I totally didn't realize until just now. Okay, that's fine. That's no problem at all. That's totally chill. These, th these things happen, right? At war, you turn your attention to something else and uh, and you completely lose track of uh, of what's going on inside of your home systems. That's totally normal, even for advanced players. Okay, so our, our armies are heading towards Hadricus. And now what we need to do is land these armies on the planets that are controlled by our opponents. From now, we should be able to see, luckily we can, that if you click on each one of the planets and go to the armies tab, you can see your opponent's garrison. And while it's not one-to-one, -one, just like ships and ship combat isn't one-to-one, -one, we can see that there are 42 people garrisoned on this planet. We have 320 troops ready to land. I think we're going to win this one pretty easily. So we're going to have our armies uh, just hover over this planet, send down, you'll see the pods get sent down to the planet, and then a super quick combat, and we were able to take control of Snarkiel. Let's do the same thing for Jaikir. They've got 83 garrison, so they'll put up a little bit more of a fight, but not much. You'll see as these units face off against each other, the, units no the unit number decreasing. So if you find yourself in a losing battle, you might want to click the retreat button so you don't lose your entire army. But yeah, that one was a very easy combat, actually. And we can now head over to Trey and land on uh, Pem Crew and take Pem Crew as well. In fact, you know what we could do to speed this up a little bit? Let's take a look at Spear Kata. They only have a, a, a garrison of 83. So in order to speed up this combat, speed up this war, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our fleet, split it in half using the split fleet button. 160 will land on Pem Crew, and the others will land on Spiria. Oh, I may have landing armies. This one land on Spiria. And now we can take two planets at a time. We can be a little bit more efficient with uh, with our our combat here. Cool. We have grabbed almost, I think, almost all the systems that we want except for Wanya. So I'm going to bring our armies in. The, this army here on Spear Kata is landing on Spiria right now. Easy. Let's bring them in towards our fleet. Just making sure that they don't have any fleets that are like cheeky fleets in the background that are coming after us. Doesn't look too bad. I'm going to merge our armies together and let me give you a little bit of a tip for armies and war. If you set your your uh, assault fleet to the aggressive stance, they will automatically follow with you, follow with your naval vessels to systems that your naval vessels fly to and they will automatically land on planets for you if they think they can win. So you don't even have to worry about checking every planet and checking to see if the numbers match up. All you gotta do is control your naval fleets. So it's one way of keeping your mind off of it. Just keep in mind that sometimes these fleets, they stay in systems for a little bit longer than your naval fleets do. And so you don't just wanna completely abandon them, but for the sake of it, I'll show you how this works. I'm just gonna only select our naval fleet move them into Wanya, and you'll see that our uh, military fleet will follow those ships automatically and jump into Wanya with them. And we'll take this system pretty quickly because our opponent only has 360 worth of defensive uh, forces. We'll take the star base pretty quickly. And then right after this happens, assuming that they don't have like a crazy, they don't, a crazy garrison, our armies automatically go to Quarek they automatically land, have a combat, and take the planet. And now, we, because we took all of the systems that we wanted, and I completely forgot to, I forgot the claim at the last second. That was my mistake. And we took all the planets that we wanted. Our opponents have automatically surrendered to us. 
we now control a much larger portion of space than we did before. And you saw another pop-up come up that says the Spear Kata is no longer a valid rival to us. And that's because they are currently pathetic to us in terms of their fleet power. And it should also be in terms of their economic power, but maybe, there it is. Took a second for that to flip over. You can't rival enemies that can't possibly stand against you. It would be it would be like rivaling a baby, right? Just kind of a ridiculous situation. So so that's not that's not possible there. But yeah, we've taken their entire space and all of their planets, which is great. We can now benefit from their civilization and and their what they've built up for us. Except some things are going to happen and this is the scariest thing for new players because it's kind of freaky. A couple things happen, probably two big things happen. The first is we gained a new species under our empire. In fact, and this is scary, there are more Spiron population on planets that we control than there are humans in our empire. That's scary. That is a scary thing. And it's scary because the Spirons, if you remember, are authoritarian and xenophobic. And we are egalitarian and xenophilic. Why I bring this up is because when your empire's species or your empire's demographics shift, so too can your governing ethics. And the Spirans who all used to live under the authoritarian xenophobic rule of Spirkata are still the same in their minds right now. We might see that the future of humanity, because we have to share space with the Spirans, moves towards a more xenophobic authoritarian rule. As new species join your empire, you can also start to recruit them as leaders. I'm not sure if we'll see a good example of this. Yes, you'll you notice this is a Spiran scientific leader and you can you can recruit Spirans to every every level of of government, including to your governors, or even the 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 overall ruler, the CEO or the president of your empire. Be very 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 careful about this because I would imagine that the next couple of years for humanity are going to be incredibly tumultuous. Now you can go into the species tab, and depending on what your ethics are, you can actually set some values here. We could say that the Spirans don't actually have full citizenship. They are actually just residents. They, they're free, but they don't control the politics. They can't be leaders. And because of that, they might be a little bit less happy than humans are, but at least they won't start shifting our massive political system towards xenophobic authoritarian rule. I would probably recommend you do this in this specific case. You can also choose their living standards. You can say, hey, Spirans, you're going to live just like any of us. Or maybe you live beneath us. Maybe you aren't equal to humanity. You will live beneath us and, and we will rule and you're lucky that you're still alive. Or possibly, hey, look, uh, you know, it sucks that you can't be leaders, but instead we are going to give you a bunch of stuff. We are just going to do whatever we possibly can to make you happy. We're going to give you iPods and cell phones and Apple Pie, you name it, as long as you don't rebel against us. Does that sound good? That could be an option that you choose. Uh, Utopian Abundance is, is a, it's a big decision, but, you know, it's a decision that you could make for your, for your, uh, your empire. Might be worth doing. If you are a authoritarian or xenophobic uh, empire, we aren't, even though we have the Spirans in our empire, you could say, you know what? The Spirans are slaves. They are our slaves and they do not have equal rights to us and they will work for us, but they, we won't have to pay them in consumer goods because who gives a slave everything that they want? That's an option that you can make in the game. Uh, similarly, if you are a fanatical purifier, or if you're like a really big bad dude, you can set them to be purged. And purging can be either you displace them, you send them to other planets, you get them out of here, they, you know, send them away, we don't want them. Or purging can be we are literally exterminating them. That's an option for you if you want to play the big bad guy. You can go ahead and do that. 
for now, I'm going to set them to residence because I don't want them to shift our politics too much. And I'm going to leave their living standards pretty much the same. Maybe we'll give them social welfare. You don't have to do this. But I think we will. Let's do I think that may have been a mistake because it gives the workers more political power. We'll see. We'll see. So the Spirens now living on these planets here of Spear Kata. You'll notice if we go in the population level, these planets are mostly Spiren. That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. You'll notice that the crime on this planet has massively increased. In fact, I would I would venture to guess. Oh, I was expecting way more crime, but Spear Kata is like a crime ridden planet. This is scary stuff. And it's only going to get scarier because all of these populations, look at that, it just jumped up to 44%. And now we have crime on our other planets here as well. The first thing you should probably do when you take a sentient species under your wing is you should probably go into every single one of the planets and make sure that you uh, crack down on crime. So I'm actually gonna go into the hollow theaters. I'm gonna replace this with a precinct house which decreases crime and increases defensive armies. I'm gonna build a precinct house. And I'm gonna build a precinct house in every single one of these new planets. Precinct house there. I think it was Wanya. Oh, we got Wanya. One, two, here we go. Precinct house here. This is going to allow us to crack down on the crime on these planets. If that crime gets too high, if the stability gets too low, the Spirens will will revolt against us and they will take their their systems back into the Spear Kata Empire. So we don't want that to happen at all costs. That is that is our number one. Let's seriously make sure that this does not happen. Now, I've been suppressing pop ups for this tutorial, but you'll notice that our factions have exposed exploded exploded and it's because all of the spirens that are now part of our empire are starting new political factions that are splitting our empire into pieces something like march of the brain okay the precinct houses were finished and crime has now completely dropped we have we have police on the street we have soldiers on the street making sure that people aren't you know Go, throwing up in arms and, and attacking us. And slowly but surely, we should see our stability increase because of it, unless this happens. We've got low stability and part because we have no consumer goods. So I'm just gonna make a purchase of consumer goods to fix that. And I would love to see these numbers change in one month's time. It's not happening. This is the biggest challenge when you win against an opponent. Taking a massive amount of planets like this is a huge, huge undertaking. And it's a big, big, big thing to balance. You've got a couple of decisions that you can do. On your planets that have low stability or high crime, you can go into the decisions and you can declare martial law. Now, this will almost completely shut down the, the planet. It will, it will cause some really bad things to happen. Pop growth will stop, uh, resource production will massively be cut, but you'll create a lot of temporary soldier jobs, which will increase crime and possibly, or sorry, decrease crime and possibly increase stability. You can see that the stability on this planet is actually mostly in part due to our approval rating with this population. Our pops have gone to some of these, these factions. They've split into groups and these groups aren't happy with us, of course, right? They, they aren't particularly happy that we are anti-democratic. They want to live in a democratic society. There is, there's been a massive, massive, massive split of everybody's approval of us and what was once very simple for us to handle with the Xeno Justice group and the Democratic's right group is now split into, what is this, eight different groups, eight different factions. These are the kind of challenges that you're going to have to face in this game. You might want to declare martial law. You'll notice that stability increased by 10% when we did that. In fact, we might have to do this across multiple planets in order to get our stability back in order. You might want to go into these factions and suppress them. 
it's not they're not going to like that but suppression might start moving population to different factions and slowly converting them over to uh to your governing ethics you might want to reform your government and you might want to go in here and say okay you know is there a civic that we could take that would um that would kind of shift people's ap appreciation of our governing ethics and make them a little bit more likely to adopt our our ethics doesn't look like there's one in here but sometimes you'll you'll find these inside of civic trees or um inside of certain buildings at times there's a lot of options for you to try to to manage this bit but note that this is happening because we took a lot of planets very very quickly and increasing stability is a very difficult thing to do it is almost primarily uh primarily comes from your approval rating of of who you are and your approval rating through factions so we've got a long road ahead of ourselves for humans but this officially will be the end of the tutorial. You know how to manage these factions. You know how to figure this thing out, right? You, you're going to choose which, which of these factions you want to appease. And very importantly, which of these factions you want your empire to be. If you lose a couple of planets of Spear Kata because those people don't want to live under your rule, eh, so be it. That's totally fine. One last thing. You'll notice that we massively exceeded our starbase capacity when we won this war and that's because the ai loves to build a bunch of unnecessary star bases this is going to increase the cost of all of your star bases across the across your empire so what i would recommend you do at the end of a combat we don't need fainovs anymore i'm going to downgrade this and we probably don't need wanyas so i'm going to downgrade wanya as well and get the starbase capacity back into order those are the big things you do at the end of a combat where you take a bunch of space. Keep an eye on your populations. Keep an eye on your species rights. Keep an eye on your factions. Suppress and promote different factions based on what you'd like to see from your empire moving forward. And get ready for a tumultuous couple of years. These planets are probably going to rebel against us. Wanya and uh, the one on Trey, Spem Crew especially are probably going to rebel against us. And that's just part of playing the game. There are a couple of other tools that you could use to do this that I haven't mentioned. You could potentially resettle population and split them across your empire. And in so doing, you would be able to sort of balance the split of humans versus uh, spirans on planets, which would make them a little bit less likely to rise up in rebellion against you. Uh, there are a bunch of creative ways to do this I will leave it to you to figure that out because this tutorial is already our longest yet. This officially, part eight, is the final tutorial in our Solaris tutorial series. I hope this was helpful to you. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget, uh, we're gonna do an FAQ series where I'm going to answer your questions that you've been leaving in comments. If I haven't answered your question or comment, I'll try to get to it. Though there are a lot of questions already. Leave me your question down in the comments. Let me know what I haven't covered as part of this series that you'd like to know more about. And I'm going to do a video about which DLC you should get for Stellaris, in which order, and a little bit of, about what each one adds to your experience because I have a lot of experience with the DLCs. So stay tuned for that. I know that's been the highest requested video that people have wanted from me. It's coming soon. Thank you, thank you, thank you for watching the channel. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button. I'll see you in our next video.